Welcome back to Business Economics. I'm Professor Phil Tomlinson, and in this session, we're going to look at some of the non-price strategies that firms use in markets with imperfect competition, i.e. those markets which are either oligopolistic or monopolistic. In particular, we're going to focus upon advertising, price discrimination and product differentiation. The last two strategies are examples of what we call market segmentation. We will consider the economic rationale for such strategies and explore their impact. We'll start with advertising. So as usual, please sit back, perhaps grab yourself a drink, listen and take some notes as we go through the material. Advertising is a very broad topic, and you are likely to come across it in other subjects as well, especially marketing. We will focus on the economics of advertising. This is important because even if you are not a marketer or an advertising executive, you may be a senior manager in a company who is asked to sign off a budget for advertising expenditure. An understanding of the economics of advertising is therefore important before you decide whether or not to authorise such expenditure. In this session, the main questions we will focus upon are what is advertising and how important it is to the economy and why firms use advertising? And finally, how might good types affect the style of advertising? Advertising is the public promotion by an individual, firm or government agency of a particular product or service that is offered for consumption by an economic agent. We come across advertising in a variety of guises in our everyday lives. And as you can see in the pie chart, through various mediums, from traditional television and news media to online search engines and social media. These adverts may be consumer focused and launched by private firms who wish us to purchase their products, or there may be adverts by government bodies to publish public information. For example, adverts that promote government guidance with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. Other publicly funded bodies also use advertising. Universities, for instance, extensively advertise their degree programmes. Advertising is a major industry in its own right, and some of you may end up working in the sector. Indeed, it was worth over £23 billion to the UK economy in 2018. If we want to compare advertising expenditure across countries, then what we really need to consider is a per capita measure i.e. the advertising expenditure per head of population. By far the largest advertising expenditure per capita is seen in the United States of America. And, as we know, the USA is a very consumer driven society and advertising is used extensively to boost consumption. There is, of course, a wide debate on whether that is a good or bad thing, although we won't enter into that debate here. For those interested, you're advised to look at the academic paper by Kieran Driver, which is on Moodle. However, you can see from this data that advertising expenditure per capita is significantly higher in the United States of America than in other countries, being twice that of Japan, for example. There also appears to be a positive relationship between income per capita and advertising expenditure per capita. This scatter plot takes advertising expenditure per capita and plots it against gross domestic products per capita, which is a measure of national income for various developed countries. The data is from 2018. You can clearly see a positive relationship with countries with higher levels of income per head, also generally having higher levels of advertising expenditure per head. This is perhaps no surprise, since countries with higher income levels have more opportunities to consume and advertising is used extensively to attract customers to particular goods and services. When comparing advertising expenditures across firms and industries, it is useful to consider the advertising expenditure to sales revenue ratio. This provides a measure of the degree of advertising intensity. As you can see, 
the degree of advertising intensity varies between firms within and across industrial sectors. And you may ask why this is so. To answer this question, let us look at the data. You can observe some patterns. First, notice how firms in the same sector tend to have similar levels of advertising intensity as their rivals. For instance, Procter & Gamble and Unilever in personal care, and Toyota, Ford and General Motors in the automotive sector, these all record similar levels of advertising intensity in their respective industries. Recall from oligopoly theory that firms are aware of the interdependent nature of competition and will therefore seek to match their rivals' actions. And this is what is happening here. We might also think about the durability of products on offer and the degree of brand proliferation in the market. We'll come back to these issues shortly. So, some stylized facts emerge from the table. As we mentioned on the previous slide, advertising intensity appears to depend upon the market structure. And in oligopoly, firms tend to compete using, on, using non price variables such as advertising, product differentiation, and R&D expenditure rather than price. And with regard to advertising, this is what is happening here. We can sketch the expected relationship between advertising intensity and the degree of market concentration. And as we can see in the diagram, this relationship is an inverted U-shape. Essentially, at low levels of market concentration, say in markets close to perfect competition, where there are many firms, each with a nominal portion of the market, advertising intensity is low. Here, firms will tend to use price as the competitive weapon. However, as markets become more concentrated, oligopolistic, oligopolistic firms will seek to avoid price competition and instead use non-price variables such as advertising. And this is where advertising intensity tends to rise. However, past a certain point, see our star in our diagram, advertising intensity starts to fall. Why? Well, in highly concentrated markets, firms recognize their increasing interdependence and come to realize that aggressive advertising will not necessarily generate a significant increase in market share because any advertising campaign they embark upon will be matched by their rivals. Advertising itself incurs significant costs and will eat into profit margins. And so firms in tight oligopolies will tend to ease off in their aggression in terms of advertising to each other. Finally, at a concentration ratio of 100%, well, that implies a monopoly. Monopolists need to advertise their product to let people know it is out there. However, a monopolist is not looking to increase market share because she already has 100% of the market. Hence, under, under monopoly, advertising intensity is lower than under oligopoly. The second factor affecting the degree of advertising intensity is the durability of the product. More durable products tend to be more expensive. Think of cars or even smartphones. In such cases, consumers are unlikely to make purchase decisions solely on the context of an advert. They like to check out the product. Perhaps in the case of a car, taking it out for a test drive. Or in the case of a smartphone, trying it out in the store. They may even do their own independent research on the product before purchase. In such cases, advertising intensity tends to be lower as firms will use other promotions. These may include, for instance, cheap finance or leasing options in the case of cars or smartphones. With less durable goods, maybe perishable items such as foods or even cheap personal care products, this is not the case. If a purchase turns out to be a bad buy, then consumers simply won't buy it again. With these type of goods, advertising is more important to encourage purchases. Finally, advertising intensity also depends upon brand proliferation. In markets where there are many brands and there is strong brand loyalty, for example in the cereals market, firms may have to spend excessive amounts upon advertising, first to entice consumers away from rivals and steal market share, and also to maintain their own brand awareness.
So how does advertising improve a firm's market position and increase their market share? This is a big question that you need to ask if you're a marketer tasked with coming up with a new advertising campaign for a particular product. Or again, if you're a senior accounts executive who is presented with a budget to approve for a particular advertising campaign. Well, essentially, successful advertising campaigns should generate significantly more sales. In economics terms, this should shift the demand curve to the right. However, the extent of this shift will depend upon the persuasiveness of the advertising campaign and also the susceptibility of consumers to advertising. Economists capture this by something called the advertising elasticity of demand. We can see this in the diagram. In figure A on the left, advertising increases demand from D1 to D2, and total revenue, which we call is price times quantity sold, increases by the green shaded area. This figure depicts advertising expenditure as relatively inelastic with respect to demand. However, in figure B on the right, sales and sales revenue increase by more, since advertising expenditures shift the demand curve further to the right, i.e. demand is more sensitive or elastic to advertising expenditure. The key point is that an advertising campaign will have more impact the greater the advertising elasticity of demand, i.e. the greater the extent to which the advertising campaign shifts the demand curve to the right. However, this is not the whole story. For the firm, ideally, advertising should also engender brand loyalty. The impact of this should not be not only to shift the demand curve to the right, but also to alter its slope and reduce the price elasticity of demand, i.e. make it more price inelastic. This will give the firm more market power and discretion over price. In this diagram, the advertising campaign has achieved both its objectives. First, it shifts the demand curve out to the right to generate more sales. But secondly, it also creates brand loyalty. The demand curve D2 here appears to be steeper and is more price inelastic. For the firm, the impact of facing a more price inelastic demand curve can be seen in this diagram. If we take the new more price inelastic demand curve D2 from the previous slide, well here we can see that the firm had na now has greater discretion over price. For instance, a rise in price from PA to PB will lose some sales, which will fall from QA to QB, and it will lose some revenue. Remember that is price times quantity sold. And this lost revenue will be illustrated by the pink shaded area. However, total sales revenue will increase since now the firm receives a higher price per unit sold. And this increase in revenue is shown by the green shaded area. Advertising can also act as a signal in markets. This point is made in a very famous paper that appeared in the Journal of Political Economy by Paul Milgram, who probably should be in line for a Nobel Prize, and John Roberts in 1986. The Milgram and Roberts paper was essentially a response to criticisms of excessive and wasteful advertising that contained very little apparent information about the product being advertised. After all, this was a time, and we're talking about the early 1980s by the way, when Ford was shown adverts of their new Ranger compact pickup trucks simply being driven off the edge of mountain cliffs. Milgram and Roberts, however, suggested such advertising was rational and could even be welfare enhancing since it could act as a signaling mechanism in the market. Their argument goes something like this. Consider a firm introducing a new breakfast cereal. A typical advertisement might have some highly paid actor eating the cereal and exclaiming how wonderful it tastes. But how much information does the advertisement actually provide? The answer is more than you might think. Because even though the advert appears to contain little hard information, it may in fact tell consumers something about product quality. 
and the willingness of a firm to spend a large amount of money in advertising can itself be a signaling mechanism to consumers about the quality of the product being offered. Why? Well, pre-purchase, let's assume consumers cannot tell the difference between a high quality and low quality cereal. This is a problem for high quality producers, such as Kellogg's, since they will not be able to attain a high enough price. Thus, to make their presence felt, Kellogg's advertise extensively because they know that once the consumers buy their cereal, they'll purchase it again and again. This is known as burning money. Burning money on advertising in this case, so as to re secure repeat purchases in the long run. Of course, we know that a low quality producer cannot do this because they're unlikely to acquire any repeat purchases. And so they would lose money on any adverts that they undertake. Advertising can also act as a barrier to entry into markets and hitherto enhance the market power of incumbent firms. This is because it can create brand loyalty, making it difficult for new firms to enter the market and steal market share. Think about any of the big markets, for example, the automobile industry or the smartphone market. The major players in these markets, whether they be Toyota or General Motors or Apple or Samsung, they will at least have established market positions and enjoy extensive brand loyalty. And it is therefore very difficult for new entrants to come into the market and steal market share. In addition, there are also economies of scale in advertising and the average cost of advertising per unit of output is much lower for large established firms. This again raises a barrier to entry. Indeed, we may see advertising as a sunk cost. Recall, a sunk cost is an investment cost that cannot be recovered even if the firm subsequently leaves the market. Some costs therefore raise entry barriers. John Sutton's, analysis of John Sutton's analysis of British and Irish industries in the early 1990s demonstrated quite clearly that in industries where advertising was intensive, entry was more difficult. On this slide, you can just about pick out two scatter plots from his analysis. These scatter plots pit the C4 concentration ratio against the market size to set up cost ratio of various British and Irish industries. As markets get larger, setup costs are smaller relative to market size. Hence, it is easier to enter the market. And so in these cases, the C4 ratio falls, implying more competition. This is quite clear in the left-hand diagram, which depicts low advertising intensive industries, where the scatter points appear in the bottom right of the diagram. However, in more advertising intensive industries, in the right-hand diagram, well here, advertising raises an entry, entry setup costs. So as the market size increases, setup costs are not necessarily lower. And so the C4 ratio doesn't necessarily fall. As you can see with the scatter points, there is a lower bound to concentration as market size increases. Finally, it is worth considering the type of goods that firms are selling and how these can affect the style of advertising. This is especially important if you're a marketer. First, we have search goods. These are goods which, which the consumer can pre-inspect before purchase. Consumers will check out the product's quality, and in the case of cars, for example, possibly take them out for a test drive. In such cases, the adverts will tend to be more informational and provide key facts about the product's attributes and where to purchase them. For example, this Techniques advert on the slide from 1981 extols the virtues of its latest hi-fi system. We then have experienced goods. These are actually goods which a consumer must first consume to really determine the product's quality. Examples here include processed foods or software programs such as the apps on your smartphone. As such, the adverts tend to be more persuasive relying upon images and celebrity endorsements to attract custom. For instance, the advert on the slide for the Holiday Inn from 1984. Here you can see it emphasises its new state-of-the-art reservation system. It seeks to persuade customers that it has entered the high-tech booking system age. Finally, we have credence goods, where a consumer cannot determine the quality of the good even after consumption. Can you believe such products exist? Well, they do, and we purchase them all the time. Examples here include insurance products, where you only find out how good an insurer really is if you need to make a claim. Or repair services, for example, 
think of a car service. To be honest, most people can't tell the difference on the actual running of a car even after it has been serviced. In such cases, the adverts tend to be a hybrid of persuasiveness and information, like this insurance advert from the early 1960s. We conclude with some caveats. These definitions are not always strictly defined, since some goods have characteristics of both search and experienced goods. What is important is customer perception. Some consumers may consider some goods as search goods, while for others they are experienced goods. Also, some goods may begin their life cycle as experienced goods, but become search goods over time. For example, designer clothing such as jeans. Once a brand becomes established, it is less of an experienced good and more of a search item. OK, who thought that advertising could be so intriguing and involved? Check out your textbook for anything on advertising. Kieran Driver's paper is a good overview of advertising and its wider influences. The Milgram Roberts paper is quite technical, so I would probably advise you read the short, easy explainer for which there is a link on Moodle.